Hello, my name is Carly Sanderson. I'm a policy fellow with Sister Reach and I will be your moderator today. I would like to welcome all of you to reproductive justice polling in the South. What Black women think in Arkansas. This is a conversation centered on Black women and their right to reproductive autonomy. We will address reproductive justice issues that affect Black women's wellness and provide policy guidance to organizers in Arkansas and elected officials in the Deep South. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Programming is being brought to you by Sister Reach, a Memphis, Tennessee-based grassroots 50C3 nonprofit supporting the reproductive autonomy of women and teens of color, poor and rural, poor and rural women, excuse me, LGBTQ+, and GNC folk. Our mission is to empower our base to lead healthy lives, raise healthy families, and live in healthy and sustainable communities. And our partners, in our own voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda, a national organizational initiative designed to amplify and lift up the voices of Black women at the national and regional levels and in our ongoing fight to secure reproductive justice for all women and girls. This webinar concludes our series of polling briefings as we've worked over the years to expand our base of engagement across the Deep South and paint a picture of what Black women really think about political issues that are impacting our bodies, our families, and our lives. This series centers the voices, experiences, and views of Black women in Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Alabama, and should be used to promote transparency on the political views of Black women. In our own voice polling data, analyzes the apprehensions and sentiments of Black women. It is important to note that this conversation is rare. Research and polling data on Black women suddenly occur, and it is the goal of In Our Own Voice to provide tangible data for the communities whose lives are most affected by policymakers. We want our local, state, and federal officials to hear our cry and our voices to understand our concerns, and most importantly, to review data that will generate policy and structural change that will allow Black women to live more abundant lives, raise healthy families, and do so while living in an educated and safe community. We thank you for tuning into this webinar to discuss the disproportionate health disparities and reproductive oppressions that our communities continue to experience, especially in a time of COVID-19. There is so much at stake. We will continue to express our concerns and priorities as we navigate through systemic racism, this global pandemic, and an ongoing assault on Black and Brown people by police. Today, we will be joined by Marcella Howe, the founder and president of In Our Own Voice, who will be presenting the polling data for Arkansas. After Marcella's presentation, we will continue the discussion with leading remarks from Sharid Scott, founder and CEO of Sister Reach, Shakia Jackson, who is with, who's the founding member of Ujima Maternity Network, Jasmine Bank, executive director of Uncode My, Cap, My Campus, Sarita Hendricks, owner and counselor at Unity Birth and Lactation Services, and Alexis Jackson, owner and doula at Your Family Tree Doula Services. Thank you all for being here today. Before the start of the presentation, I want to go over a few housekeeping rules. We anticipate that you all may have questions regarding the data, so we will reserve a five-minute time slot for questions. During the presentation, however, the chat box will be disabled. If you're watching via Facebook, you may pose questions during that time during the comment section. Now let's get into the data that brought us all here. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, Marcella Howe, founder and president of In Our Own Voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda, who will present the polling data. Thank you, Carlise. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, as Carlise mentioned, we did polling in a number of Southern states in order to find out where um, Black women stood on certain issues that dealt with abortion rights, um, financial issues that looked at the state of Black women in each of these states in terms of uh, their economic uh, positioning. And so our, our polling data that I will present today was um, done by a research firm called Perry Undum, who we've used in the past for both our national and our state-based polling. Um, so I wanna go into the next slide, please. Um, we actually polled 501 black women ages 18 and up in, um, in Arkansas. Of those people that we talked to, 86% of them were voters or had voted in, in each of the recent elections. Next. Arkansas population, um, Black people are 16% of Arkansas's overall population. 
of that black population, 52% are women and girls and 48% are um, men and boys. We asked a question about where people stood on abortion rights and whether or not um, they wanted to see Roe v. Wade stand as it is or overturn. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, in 1973, the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision established that a woman had the constitutional right to access abortion care. And we asked the question, would you like to see the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade or not? And 65% of those who we talked to said they did not want Roe v. Wade overturned. 33% of uh, people, Black women in Arkansas said they did. Next. We asked a question about whether or not people felt that uh, having access to abortion, being able to plan your family had um, an important impact on the financial security of a family. And 96% of Arkansas Black women said that control over childbearing is very important to maintaining financial security for their family. We looked at what financial security meant. 27% of Black families live in poverty in Arkansas. 37% of those Black families living in poverty are headed by a single woman. And um, we also asked about education. 81% of Black women had high school diplomas or more education. So it was not about um, their education level that was leading them to be involved in um, poverty. Next. So we looked at um, their pay. What we found was that black women in Arkansas make 65 cents for every dollar a white man makes doing the same job. What that means over a lifetime is that black women in Arkansas lose $665,600 over a lifetime because of this wage gap. And it means in order to make up the same amount of money that a white man will have made by the time he retires at the age of 65, black women would have to work until they were 81 years old. Think about that. Have to work until they were 81 years old simply to make up that wage gap. Next. We also asked them um, about whether or not they had children. 76% of the people who responded to our poll said that they had children. Next. And we also asked them what they felt should be part of basic health care. 92% uh, said that care for pregnant women should be part of basic health care. 84% said that access to contraception or family planning should be part of basic health care. But only 44% said that abortion care should be part of what they considered basic health care. Um, we also asked respondents what kind of issues they considered when they were thinking about starting a family or expanding their family. 59%, more than half, said that access to a living wage job um, factored into their decision to parent or not to parent. 55% said having affordable health care. 53% said having affordable housing. 51% said food security was an important factor. 50% said that racism factored into whether or not they decided to have children or to expand their family. 48% said childcare access, having access to quality childcare was important. And 36% said that over-policing actually factored into whether or not they decided to have children or to expand their family. Racism impacted a lot. 48% said that racism has a negative effect on mental and emotional health. 33% said that racism had a negative impact on physical health. 
And then when we asked younger black women between the ages of 18 and 34, 59% said that racism impacted their mental and emotional health. 36% of black women in Arkansas said that over-policing factored into de their decisions about having a child. However, 56%, more than that 20% higher of younger women, 18 to 34, said that over-policing in their community impacted their decision-making about whether or not to have a child. We asked questions about what kind of support they felt that people seeking an abortion should have. Um, they 76% said that the experience of, of abortion care should be simple. 73% said it should be affordable. 68% said that they wanted people who were helping them in clinics to be respectful of their decision. That is not trying to um, convince them to do something else, not trying to convince them not to have an abortion once they had made up their decision, made their own decision. 66% said that abortion care should be available in their community. And 62% said that abortion care should be available as soon as possible. However, when we asked the question about whether or not they knew if abortion was legal in Arkansas, only 41% said that it was legal. 11% said that they did not think abortion was legal anymore in Arkansas. And a whopping 48%, almost half, said that they were unsure whether or not abortion was still legal in Arkansas. So we asked the question about whether or not they felt that abortion was legal nationally and in their state. 64% said that the right to abortion in our country is at risk, where 33% said that it was fairly secure. 56% of the respondents said that they thought the right to have an abortion in Arkansas is at risk and 41% said that they thought it was fairly secure. 36% said that it was becoming harder to get an abortion in Arkansas. 17% said that it was becoming easier and 43% said that the access is not changing. So you have 48% who think that abortion is, who are unsure as to whether or not abortion is legal in Arkansas. And then you have a high number who feel that it is at risk, 64% who felt that it was also at risk. Next. We asked people who they thought should make decisions about abortion care, um, whether it should be the person, the woman or person looking for an abortion or whether they thought it should be lawmakers. 62% said that the person involved should decide how and when to access abortion care, that it was not up to lawmakers to make those kind of decisions, despite the fact that lawmakers were passing very restrictive laws in Arkansas. We also asked whether or not people who were, since 80 something percent were voters, we asked them whether or not they were more likely to support a candidate who supported abortion rights, 52% said yes to that. We also asked people in terms of abortion, whether or not they felt that there was stigma around the issue of abortion. Because remember, only 44% said that they thought abortion was part of basic health care or should be part of basic health care. 54% said, that abortion was not a religious issue for us, for them. 73% said that abortion was a responsible choice. And 78% said that they rejected any kind of abortion stigma or shame. So you can see the pattern. They feel that 
abortion should be um, kept legal. They were opposed to Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court, by a very conservative Supreme Court. They felt that abortion care should be available in their own community and that it should be simple, affordable, that they people should not second guess their decisions. And they also felt that it was not a religious issue for them and that it could be a responsible choice and they rejected any shame around abortion care. Next. Now I'm gonna turn over to Carlise again to um, have panelists discuss some of these findings. Carlise. Thank you, Marcella, for highlighting these important findings. We will now move into discussion with our panelists, Shakia Jackson, Jasmine Banks, Sarita Hendricks, and Alexis Jackson to give their perspectives on how this data is important to women and the communities that they are a part of in the South. But before we will hear from Sharice, founder and CEO of Sister Reach. Sharice, please share with us how this polling data plays a role in your line of work as an organizer and community mobilizer on the ground in Tennessee. Well, I, uh, thanks so much, Carlise, and thanks so much, uh, Marcella, for offering this polling data. I don't know that the ways that this kind of impacts our work on, in Tennessee is as important as just what the data continues to lift up, this continuous thing, state to state. This is the last state um, that we've been able to, to get this polling data from, just so that we have a better understanding of Black women's uh, ideas and thought processes around reproductive health care access that includes abortion access, um, as well as kind of the, the, the understanding around what Black women are just thinking in general. I still think that um, something that we've heard as a kind of a continuation, in every state, Black folks have been the smallest number with some of the highest impacts of, in, in reproductive and sexual health. Um, uh, just like, you know, 16% in Arkansas, which is 17% here in Tennessee, right? I think we saw maybe 15% or so in Mississippi and even in Kentucky, we still kind of in those low teens as far as our, uh, how many black folks, are, you know, actually um, make up this, the state um, as far as residents. However, we continue to have the same kind of thought processes about what access needs to look like, um, you know, where our values line up with that. I thought what was really important was the 81% of black women in Arkansas were educated black women. Right, which kind of already pushes back against this notion that Southern Black women, uh, you know, don't have a kind of a, a grip on their reproductive and sexual health information and education. That you know that by and large we aren't, you know, uh, uh, change agents and stakeholders in the communities in which we live and work and worship and serve, um, and that uh, yeah, and that we aren't necessarily contributors to uh, kind of what is happening in the labor force or just kind of the culture of, of the space in which we live. So I thought it was just really important to lift up the fact that we're, you know, we're talking about women from all walks of life that were, that were polled, but yet, uh, you know, we're still talking about women who also are included in that, um, uh, this percentage of uh, folks who are either educated and, and are working, who are either employed in a sustainable way or even underemployed, potentially are even unemployed um, in this point, but still have something to give, something to offer to the conversation about what they believe, um, uh, you know, it, it, of what access to reproductive health care or lack thereof is doing to our communities. The wage gap piece continues state to state to state uh, that we're still having to work until, you know, we are in our 80s in order to earn uh, the equivalent of a white man's dollar. Uh, and there still continues to be a disinvestment in making sure that the, that the households of, uh, of Black, led by Black women and or the households uh, that we are a part of are properly sustained. And yet we are expected to do our best, to be our best, to you know, want to have children, be able to raise them without any type of hindrance um, and or uh, can, you know, or are able to uh, to even be healthy in our own decision making, having access to the health care that we need. I thought it was uh, so that was something else that kind of uh, jumped out to me as, uh, as a very important piece that continues this thing of uh, the impact in uh, the ways that uh, that black women are experiencing our health care and our access. 
Um, I thought that the parenting access continues a theme as well, that a living wage continues to ring as, the, as one of the highest pieces that are important in healthcare, housing, food sustainability. In other words, if our basic needs are met, if a quality of life is something that Black women can have access to, then we make the best decisions for ourselves and our families and our communities without necessarily needing the help of anybody else to help to inform that. So I thought that that was an important piece to lift up from Arkansas. Uh, however, but that racism, continues to be an impacting kind of thread of not just across this country, but I think it's just very, you know, there's a different life <laughs> that's happening here in the South. And there was a different understanding about, um, um, you know, about the way, the, the culture in which we are living and working and are attempting to maneuver with and around white people and what those expectations and hindrances look like for our lives and for our families and for our ability to even want to bring children into this world or not. Um, I thought that it was also important, of course, one of the pieces, since we do a lot of faith-based organizing, was that 54% of Black women who took the poll be believed that abortion access was not a religious issue. So again, that continues to push back uh, against this narrative that, first of all, all Black women in the South are Christian, that all Black women in the South have an issue with, with the abortion uh, in some type of a religious context that black women who are also religious are yet making decisions about our health and wellness without needing the input and support of other folks putting us in hell or not about it. Um, and that not wanting to have any type of shame around it and seeing, is a, seeing it as a responsible choice continues to lift up the narrative that Sister Reach continues to push across the, the way that things are happening here in the Southeast. We're making decisions based on what makes sense for ourselves and our families and our communities, um, even when those decisions are aligned with our faith or, or a different faith or none at all, that we are making these decisions and that we need to continue to be able to do so uh, without any type of hindrance or, um, uh, or control from, from outside individuals who don't have a vested interest in our households and yet are trying to make decisions on behalf of our families. So I'll just stop. Thank you, Sharice, for sharing that piece. We will now hear responsive remarks from each panelist and a discussion will follow. Each speaker will have five minutes to respond briefly to how they believe this polling data reflects the community of Arkansas and the effects it has on their advocacy work. Shakia, based on the women surveyed, approximately 59% of Arkansas constituents are concerned with not being paid a livable wage and having access to quality and affordable health care when they decide whether they want to bear a child. How does this polling data appeal to you and your role as a founder member of Ujima Maternity Network? What are your concerns? Okay, thank you for having me. Um, for those that are not familiar, um, Ujima Maternity Network Incorporated is Arkansas's first and only all black network of black um, birth workers, advocates. It was created to address the lack of representation in the birth work field, um, lactation education, as well as access to equitable care. Um, Arkansas is a very rural state, like 44% of the population lives in rural areas. Our poverty level is 17%. We are the fourth highest in the US, you know, with, with poverty. Um, and our childhood rate is even higher at 25%. We know that the employment, um, that having employment is a social determinant of health in Arkansas. And it's a factor that affects everyone's health. So all those 79% of our Kansans work or have a salary work for the private sector or for a state job, um, we still make, you know, lower, um, lower than the national average. So the polling data was very appealing to me because it tells me that women are focused on family planning and preventing unwanted pregnancies, um, which has been an increasing shift. Our teen pregnancy rates are decreasing, even though they're still high, they're decreasing. And we see more young women and um, young men becoming uh, aware and acknowledging the fact that they just can't afford kids right now. And so, as I mentioned earlier, with the, the poverty rate for the state being at 25%, having a stable job, steady income, a safe living environment, um, healthy foods, those all contribute to our health. And higher rates of poverty, you know, they've been linked to higher um, infant mortality rates. So by actively waiting to start a family, women, uh, men, 
they are they are addressing and improving their social determinants of health to create better health outcomes. And I wanted to also um, piggyback off what you all mentioned earlier that racism outweighs income and education. You know, you all stated that 81% of black women are educated. However, we still have the highest mortality rates and the highest um, income mortality rates in the state. Uh, March and Noms released a report card, I believe it was a week or so ago, which um, talks about the health of moms and babies and nearly every state in the South received an F. So that within itself is kind of like, okay, we, we need to identify what the, we need to, to, to bring racism more to the forefront and, and, and identify that as a public health issue. So I, I want to thank you all for doing the poll and data. It was interesting to see, you know, how women, um, how women feel. And I, I agree with them 100%. And there's still more work to be done. I think we may have lost Carly. So it looks like we're moving on to Jasmine Banks. If you can also lift up your thoughts about the data. Yeah, so my name is Jasmine. My pronouns are she, her. I am a proud Southern uh, queer black mom of four. Um, I, I bring these things into the conversation because they're, they're critical to inform not just my professional work, but my personal work. Um, being a mom of four with a non-binary partner and a daughter who is a black trans girl, I'm able to speak to the ways in which this information around reproductive justice and rights is really, really impactful. I also want to say that I have had an abortion, which is a critical part of this conversation. Um, I'm a licensed mental health clinician in the state of Arkansas, and I'm also the executive director of Uncoke My Campus, which is the work I want to uplift in this moment. So Uncoke My Campus comes to the conversation because we organize students, educators, and community stakeholders at the site of um, higher education to address the ways in which the Koch network um, known for Charles and David Koch and their larger political apparatus uses their dark money donations to really manipulate our democracy. Um, and what's so salient about the polling information here is we can look toward folks like Tom Cotton, toward Asa Hutchinson in particular, who were both funded by the Koch network. Additionally, the Koch network gives dark money or super PAC donations to political grassroots and grass tops organizers. So when you think about the Susan B. Anthony list who actively work to subvert um, black women's access to reproductive care, um, when you think about concerned women um, of the United States, another um, political arm, um, which are largely cisgender, heterosexual, um, socioeconomic privileged white women who are funded by multi-billionaire corporate um, private interests to then subvert our well-being. So when we also think about um, the 18, for example, the 18 week abortion ban that came down last March. Um, Susan B. Anthony List was one of the political operations that organized actively and lobbied legislators to get these model bills passed. Those model bills were written by think tanks that were funded by the Koch network. So really when we're talking about whether it's environmental justice, economic justice, when we're talking about reproductive justice and gender-based justice, um, there is not a single place that you can look where the Koch network don't have their fingerprints um, on the state um, level in Arkansas, all the way up to the highest court in our land, right? If you think about Amy Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch, um, Kavanaugh, who have had really disastrous implications for Roe v. Wade, as well as Title X and other things that we think about that are protections for us, those po folks were implanted with Coke money, um, with Coke policy, Coke think tanks, and then ultimately folks, like I said, on the ground who organized um, and build political grassroots power again we're, we're putting these people in place. And so it's really critical as we have this conversation about black families and well-being, whether it's cisgender or transgender folks, who, whoever we are along the spectrum, that we understand that on 
the right, there are a group of political apparatuses that have tons and tons of money, I'm talking about billions of money, invested in not just creating policy and model legislation, but also building political grassroots power. And so um, students in Arkansas, educators in Arkansas, need to absolutely understand the ways in which our, our education institutions are being funded, you, excuse me, are being leveraged with research that is pro this anti-choice agenda from the COPE network, as well as um, our legislators are being bought and paid for. Um, so that's that's something definitely we need to be considering as we're looking for our goals in 21 and ways to uplift ourselves in the South um, and, and evaluate the ways in which we are going to have a, a really critical fight um, because the COPE network not only, as I said, not only does the federal level, but on the state level, our judges, our, le our legislators and our representatives all um, are being implanted by the Koch network. And all of these folks disproportionately have a very, very um, radical right, conservative um, definition of what the nuclear family is, of what family planning should or shouldn't be, um, even down to their, their religious views. So, um, you know, a, a way to protect our, our black families is to consider the threat of the Koch network. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Sarita, historically black women have been the cornerstone for wellness work from wet nursing while enslaved to advocating on the front lines of the reproductive justice movement. Nevertheless, our history and leadership are often forgot about or undermined. Can you discuss your role in lactation counseling in Arkansas and how it supports positive maternal and infant health outcomes for black women, newborns and families while challenging stigma and oppressive narratives around black motherhood? Can you hear me okay? Oh, no, okay. Can you hear us, Sarita? Maybe we can move to the next person and then come back to Sarita. Yes. Alexis, we know that black women are more than twice as likely to die while giving birth and of pregnancy related causes than their white counterparts. What are the policy and community changes in Arkansas that will help address the black maternal health epidemic? How does the birth justice movement in Arkansas address systemic oppression in the medical field? What kind of services and supports do doula provide during pregnancy and labor and delivery and in the postpartum period for Black women? All right, I want to say thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak on this. Um, but just to throw a couple more figures out for people, um, in Arkansas, um, we have the fourth highest maternal mortality in the United States. Um, the maternal mortality rate for Black mothers is 71% compared to 27.8% of white women. And there are a plethora of reasons um, ranging from pre-existing conditions to lack of access to care and actual lack of care that contributes to these numbers. So what is Arkansas doing to combat these numbers? Um, I found that Arkansas has really made a big effort to not only educate the general public about um, what's going on, but also physicians and other people in the medical staff. Um, we have the Angels Alliance, which is the antenatal neonatal guidelines education learning system. And it's a collaboration of physicians, state and federal entities, nonprofit entities, they all come together um, to improve adherence to evidence-based guidelines in antenatal, neonatal, and high-risk pregnancy care. Um, we also have entities such as Arkansas Birth Matters, ICANN, and of course the Ujima Network, who strive to provide real-time policy changes that and resources um, 
for the general public so they can become better educated about their health and their options for childbirth. But with all of this access, with all of this knowledge, with all of these things that everyone knows, we are still having this problem. And in my personal experience, um, what I have personally went through in my childbirth um, or both of my childbirth experiences and what I've uh, witnessed um, from other mothers, one of the main issues that Black women are facing during pregnancy and childbirth is not being heard. Um, when women seek to hire a doula, they do it for a lot of reasons. Um, but for Black women, or at least for the mothers who come to me, I find that their main concern is advocacy. They want to, they, they look for a doula to make sure that they will be heard inside of a hospital or when they go to their doctor. Um, and just a quick story um, about a young black mother who she was initially looking for a midwife, came across my website and we ended up talking. Um, I told her, reach out to me for whatever reason. It doesn't matter. Even though I'm not a midwife, I want to help. Fast forward a couple of days, she did. And I'm convincing her on the phone to return back to the ER um, because she sat in the waiting room and she didn't feel good. She wasn't being seen, so she left. Um, well, from the symptoms she described, she was suffering from hypoglycemia. And I'm like, you need to go back. You have to go back. So she did. Um, she texted me the next morning to let me know that she waited in the waiting room in the emergency waiting room for hours and her blood sugar was dropping, dropping, dropping. She kept asking, can she have a snack? Can she have drink? Can she get some type of help? And of course it fell on deaf ears. When she made it to the back and they took her vitals, her blood sugar was a 40. And all the nurse could say is, how are you still conscious and your blood sugar is that low? Um, that really touched me in a special way, so much so that I wrote that hospital a letter on her behalf with her permission. And I explained to them how their lack of care contributes to the Black maternal mortality in the state of Arkansas. Um, so as a doula, in any doula, you know, um, the baseline is we give unbiased, evidence-based emotional and physical support. But being a Black doula for a Black mother means so much more than that. Um, we are looked at as place fillers and we have to, or gap fillers, and we have to fill the gap between the mother and her medical provider. We have to fill the gap between the mother and her significant other sometimes, or we have to fill the gap between the mother and herself. And so as a black doula for a black mother, we just don't doula her pregnancy. We have to doula the whole individual. We have to doula everything about the black mother. So I, for me, I give extra prenatals for my uh, clients. And I, I tell them to take a childbirth education class of some sort. It is like a must. And we do that before we have our first prenatal so we can have real meaningful conversations, uh, not only about the good feelings and the physical feelings, but real meaningful conversations about her health, her health care, and what is really going on with her. Um, I also advise all of my moms to make birth plans. Um, a birth plan is nice. You can write down all your wants, your desires, but it also forces them to have a meaningful conversation with their physician. So if they want delayed cord clamping or they don't want these drugs or they don't want this, then I always say, take your birth plan to your physician and talk about it. Um, I also encourage family members um to be more involved with um the moms because of course if someone's checking on you more often 
you do a little better. If someone's asking you, what are you eating? Are, are you drinking water? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Then you'll say yes, yes, yes. So I really work on building the moms up. And, and so they will be empowered to really speak their desires and speak their wants and be strong in it and don't feel like their pregnancy and their childbirth is something that's just going to happen to them. It is something that they can be actively involved in. So with, with all that being said, um, what changes in policies would help address this disparity? To be honest, I, I really don't know because this is information that anybody can Google at any given time. And these numbers have been like this for years. So what I feel is that we could, if there was a way to find, if there was a way to, to make these people accountable, um, if there was a way that the, the nursing staff that was in the emergency room with this young lady who kept, you know, shooing her away, um, if there was a way that we can hold those people responsible, hold these hospitals responsible for when they don't give care to these mothers, that there is a consequence that happens. Um, but in the meantime, I feel like while we're waiting on tangible changes that we as black women need to come together and really, really help black mothers and black women in this time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexis. Sarita, historically black women have been at the cornerstone for wellness work from wet nursing while enslaved to advocating on the front lines of the reproductive justice movement. Nevertheless, our history and leadership are often forgotten about or undermined. Can you discuss your role in lactation counseling in Arkansas and how it supports positive maternal and infant health outcomes for Black women, newborns, and families, while challenging stigma and oppressive narratives around Black motherhood? Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you for having me. Um, back in, um, well, I'm the owner of Unity Birth and Lactation Services. Um, I'm also one of the co-founding members with Kijima Maternity Network. Um, back in 2010, when I moved to Arkansas, um, I quickly realized um, that I wasn't quite in the home um, melting pot of California that I had once been in. Um, I noticed very quickly that there was a um, significant um, disparity in the breastfeeding rates here. Um, I have the I had the pleasure of working in a health department where I was able to counsel mothers on a peer basis there, and that's kind of where I got my interest in the birth world, in the desire to um, work on these numbers, if you would. Um, a lot of times when we have or when I've seen moms come into the health unit or have spoken to women, um, a lot of their opinions are. Uh, opinions of breastfeeding, opinions on birth in general are based on some very um, um, old fashioned, if you will, stigmas that have been put on us as black women. Part of what I do and part of what I've been working on doing is really just being present with these women, um, being present with these young girls, sharing my stories, my own personal stories with pregnancy, with breastfeeding to show them um, you know, what could be normal. Some of the things that um, I share with those moms with regard to breastfeeding is we, historically black women have breastfed. We've always breastfed. Um, what happened to our, our, our culture in the time of slavery is that we were forced to wet nurse slave owners' babies. And that kind of has put a sour taste in people's mouths. And it's just kind of, been passed on from generations to generations, almost to a point where younger moms that say, well, I don't, bre I don't want to breastfeed, they don't even know why. And if you talk to their mothers or their grandmothers, they kind of share those stories. So what I do currently is encourage these moms to dig deep within themselves. I share the benefits of breastfeeding. I share the benefits of, like Alexis was saying, making those birth plans so that you can have the best possible outcome. 
getting them in touch with some some people that look like them, some resources, some doctors, um, other counselors, other doulas, trying to research midwives and things of that sort that look like them because representation matters. And in our culture, if we're not seeing ourselves in these integral roles, then we're less likely to seek out those those um, those actions. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm I'm doing. Thank you so much, Sarita, for sharing your experience with us. Sharice, Sister Reaches in the Bible Belt where legislators have long posed from a religious standpoint when crafting legislative measures, oftentimes blurring the lines between the pulpit and policy decision-making. Why do you think that this moral argument has been viable for so long and aided in the oppression of reproductive autonomy of Black women? I think it's so deep uh, that, you know, meanwhile, <clears throat> Sarita is sharing her piece while we're having like another conversation, uh, you know, where we're really lifting up exactly this issue. I mean, without saying it directly, that at the end of the day, we're still kind of living in this intersection of folks' um, biblical interpretations who also happen to hold political power, who also happen to be able to move um, and, you know, move policy and, uh, you know, take folks' sacred autonomy away from them uh, just because of this kind of, un the, you know, their own kind of understandings around theology, uh, this, this very uh, interesting and unethical conflation of uh, church and state, um, and just thinking about the ways that, you know, that this, this continues to not only be an issue that we're dealing with in Tennessee, I mean, this has become an American issue, but especially in the South, right? In the South, uh, you know, our our governors, our elected officials, our senators, and our and our congresspersons, our uh, yeah, state representatives uh, identify as Christian mo more than not. And you know, and I say as someone who also identifies as a believer uh, within the Christian understanding that it's it's the hottest mess. Um, to expect people, you know, to, to mandate people to believe what you believe, the ways in which you believe. Um, would there to be no room for folks to grow into their understandings, for folks to allow space for different understandings, for people to, un to allow space for none at all. But uh, at the end of the day, this is the, the terrain in which we navigate, trying to do our work, trying to organize, trying to live our lives uh, in, the, in the South. Um, one of the things that, you know, that we've been trying to kind of flesh out, and it seems like it's taken so long for me to try to flesh it out for the parts that I really want to grapple on, is this kind of understanding of like theological fascism and the way that, you know, it has just plopped itself in the midst of all of these, uh, in the midst of our lives and in the midst of these uh, multiple oppressions that folks on this call who are serving folks, folks on this call themselves have had to navigate and the ways in which it hinders the work that we're trying to do to make sure that, that each person has access, um, not just to their human rights, but just to a quality of life um, that, that has been you know, informed by, uh, by folks who say that they love God, but don't, don't espouse that the character, behavior, or actions that they say that they, from what they believe, right? Um, but I, so I think that you know what it, what this has looked like on the ground has been a couple things for us is trying to partner with as many folks who who believe like we believe you know who believe that there needs to be a very defined line of demarcation between what you believe as a person and what I need to believe and how all of that impacts our abilities to access health and wellness. Um, I think some other things that we've been trying to do is. Uh, you know, to work with our faith communities and try to find folks who think the way that we think. I was so pleased to see the statistics out of Arkansas, the way that I've been pleased to see those statistics in other areas. But it's one thing to answer it in a poll. It's another thing to stand before your church and say these same things. It's another thing to have to navigate it in the community, um, you know, and, and, have, and, and deal with different microaggressions. And there's so many of them. It's, this is bigger than an abortion piece, right? This is bigger than folks pushing back about the ways that they feel about uh, abortion access. This, you know, it, it still is a race conversation because it also comes down to the ways in which you show me godly love also the, are, 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 is also determined by the color of our skin, right? That the ways that you, that you make 
um, you know, health care available is also dictated by the color of our skin. You know, um, meanwhile, we, we, you know, we hold some of the highest disparities across health issues. Uh, and, we, and all of this is being quote unquote done in Jesus name. So, you know, I, I think that it's just something to push back on. It's something that I want to see all of us push back on more and more state to state. Um, you know, that we, okay, if, if this is the pattern, if this is the lens in which you are trying to offer us support, then it needs to look a little bit more like love and a little bit less like dictatorship uh, and abandonment, you know, discipline, you know, because we've not shown up in a way that you, that you think that we should show up without you taking responsibility for this culture of chaos that you have, uh, that you have informed, not only with, you know, this kind of interesting white Jesus theology, right? But also this, this very white supremacist theology that continues to harm, harm us at our very core. So, you know, I'll stop there for time. Thank you so much, Sharice. Thank you to all of our panelists. Your comments were insightful and provided a unique perspective from your personal experiences and your work on how it is important to listen to Black women. Now we will open the floor for questions by our audience. Jasmine, we saw that numbers turned in for the better in this recent election. Can you talk a little bit about how Black women and women of color help navigate the election data this past cycle? Well, I don't do a lot of electoral organizing. I partner with folks who do a lot of electoral organizing. But what I do know is um, young Black students and students of color who are interested about climate, who are interested about um, addressing the ways in which state sanctioned violence has come to the forefront of many conversations. We're definitely, you know, in mass out organizing. Um, I think, at, you know, I think towards states like Arizona that did incredible work because their Latinx communities were showing up. And so I think less, you know, it, you know, again, not having the authority as the elector organizer here, but being able to be adjacent to that. I think folks were seeing the ways in which corporate private interests were being put um, on the ballot rather than people. Um, and that folks organized around this idea that we were no longer going to be engaging in public suffering for private gain. Um, and so I think with that rhetoric and also following, you know, the leadership of, of Black folks, particularly in the South, um, you were able to see how the grassroots voters were activated and were brought together in care networks, which is what we're good at, right? Like we bring our communities along with us. Um, so that's what I'll offer to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jasmine, another question for you. <laughs> How can young people champion reproductive justice on their campuses? So I think that when we talk about reproductive justice at the side of the campus, we have to be thinking about all sorts of things, right? Whether it's, um, you know, abortion, access and care um, within the medical institutions that are adjacent to the campus, whether it's Title X and gender-based issues. Um, as far as what UNCOC My Campus does, we look at the research and the information that educators are pushing out, who's funding that research and education, um, and then really make it transparent to the public, right? We, we've been able, been able to uncover, um, for example, um, research that was Coke funded by Coke funded professors that promoted eugenics and ideas that um, have long been disproven and, and actually very are harmful to our communities. And so if you're organizing on the campus um, with Coke as a center issue, that's one way, of course, that you can do it. Um, another way is to look at the funding um, for the foundations and the relationship between the money and your institutions. Who's funding um, 
really matters. We've been able to uncover in Virginia, for example, how donor agreements from the Charles Koch Foundation um, allowed hiring, firing, allowed to determine research, which then affected policy and think tank, you know, think tank operations and inform legislators. And so really ensuring that the, the money that is going into your institutions is not funding um, an ideological warfare that is about um, limiting our bodies and our rights to our economic and reproductive um, freedom and possibility is really critical to organize around. Thank you so much. I'm going to open up this question to anyone that is wanting to answer. You all, you each shared the need for advocacy by individuals and the need to improve health, health outcomes in the, our, in the Black community. Are there resources that you recommend so that Black women, Black families, and other women of color can stay more informed and advocates for themselves and their communities? I know y'all just heard from me, but I have a really great resource that we use at Uncoke My Campus. Um, there's a wonderful organization called Family Story. Um, it is a think tank that is doing a lot. It's partnered with Color of Change and it's, they're doing a lot to debunk the myths on the black family. Um, you know, the deadbeat black dad or the aggressive black single mother and the welfare queen, right? All of those things emerged from, um, you know, the, you know, a memo that ultimately um, shaped how neoliberalism um, spoke about our families and then legislated our families. And so using their um, talking guide, they have a report, a report that shows what the myth is and then actually shows the data. That's really, really critical as we're providing edu political education for folks. Um, it's also important to state from my perspective, of course, because you'll hear me ring the Coke bell over and over again. Um, the Coke network funds lots of think tanks that push misinformation about working class, poor um, black families. Um, and so it's really, really important to understand that not only are they funding these legislators who legislate against our well being, but they also are funding um, the production of knowledge and culture creation that keep us um, in these cycles of these myths that ultimately um, uphold structural oppression and systemic white supremacy. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you all for sharing and joining with us, and especially thank you to all of our panelists. We really appreciate the work that you're doing to uplift Black women in the Deep South. For more information, follow Sister Reach at Sister Reach. And in our own voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda at Black Women, SRJ. Have a wonderful rest of your day. It was great doing this polling data with you all. As we conclude this series, we will work to uplift and amplify back Black families. Have a good one.